originally, when I volunteered to do a uh, talk on women in science, I was, you know, and, <clears throat> you know Sheila uh, Whitnall, <clears throat> you know, came to mind because she was the first woman who was in charge of, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Department of the Air Force. So anyway, when I started going into this uh, business of women in science, I think I made the remark several, a couple of times during our sessions that it's a wonder some of these women even speak to us. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, so it, it does talk about her, but I get, a, I get a, a lot of other women who really made a big dent in science that I, I learned about. So I'm going to present that also. So, and the other thing I'm going to say too is I saw an article about this is you know in a Jewish tradition the boys get a bar mitzvah. Well, there was a big something in the ad. I, I saw something. It was big news. This was the hundredth anniversary of girls being allowed also to have a bat mitzvah to go through the same uh, <clears throat> thing as a boy. So I just thought it was interesting. All right. Now here you go. Here you go. <clears throat> oh, I got a call too from. Uh, oh God. Anyway, f from my from my colleague that used to work at MIT at at Hanscom, and he was telling me that Sheila never came down to Hanscom. Well, I think maybe I know why because her main interest was for equal opportunity for for women in science. And it, there's like one point in, in my talk that I will, uh, you know, highlight that. So anyway, uh, she had a lifetime of exploring the unknown. And she did define <clears throat> the character of the Air Force, which I thought was good because I was in the uh, engineering procurement business. You know, we wrote the contracts and helped let the con you know, we, you know, selected contractors and stuff like that. And we really had to be ethical, I mean, to the nth degree. Um, it's, then I realized she was on the sexual harassment and discrimination. Well, I mean, thank God in Hanscom, I never saw that. You know, everybody was treated fairly, no matter if you were a man or a woman. And uh, next slide. <clears throat> There we go. This is some wingtip vortex that I found that somebody from MIT had said that her, her research had even larger applications. You know, she made an impact, you know, of the vortices. And it was quite impressive because when you come to think about it, not only, you know, we have an air ocean, we have a water ocean, and, you know, submarines, to me, they, uh, they're analogous to airplanes, but they're going through water instead of the air. <clears throat> and while she was at MIT, she did something that nobody else did, is that um, you know she was asked to do certain things. And she did. Now, I got something on my screen that I can't get rid of this. I don't know what this is. Can uh, you need to click. This? You're a click. You're in edit mode. You need to click off. Where that, so where where press I click the escape button. In my what? Press press the escape button on your oh, keyboard. Oh, the escape button, yeah. Whoop. OK, that didn't do anything. I press the escape button and um, that's lovely. Oh, there it's gone. Thank God. That, that was annoying. Maybe I'll just, you know. <clears throat> you know, she made a, a uh, I mean, her discovery on the, uh, the vortex. I remember when I used to do a lot of flying that there were some instances where some planes, that I'm, I'm not sure if it was Logan or not, that some smaller planes tipped over. I don't remember anything else about it. But it was due they were too close to the planes in, in front of them. <clears throat> but anyway, she had the patience to solve it, and she did. 
There's that thing again. Anyway, she became the first director of the uh, Department you know, of Transportation, you know, in the early 70s, and that was the beginning it's of her, really of her career in, in that sense. Now, here we go. This, is, this slide, uh, to me, is, one of the, is the most important slide of the whole talk. It is the, uh, the last paragraph, <clears throat> you know, where Daniel Hastings, well, you can read it for yourself, right? That the women were put on the wait list pile, says Hastings. We collectively felt ashamed and we went back to correct, correct that. Well, this is when I started looking into women in other fields, whether it be science or what, and even in the religious fields, you know, women would, and then, of course, the obvious one, <clears throat> of course, women couldn't vote. They had no brains. It didn't make any sense to me, you know. So women have been um, fighting for equal rights for a long, long time, even since biblical times. Um, <clears throat> Sheila's advice was we need to make women uh, welcome. Otherwise, you know, some of these... Uh, specialties are going to die out. Um, the Boston Globe had a very interesting article since I, I was doing this paper about Maria Mitchell. Now, I don't remember if I read about her at all, but uh, she was one of the early women who started a school for girls. And there also, it, was, it didn't make any difference if you were white or black. So it, she wasn't a racist. And here's this. Maria Mitchell proposed a stop on a school for girls in Nantucket, 1835. You know? And, she, and you can see here where she's giving instructions in reading, spelling, and geography, and, and, and arithmetic, geometry, and all this other stuff. And that's pretty good, $3 a quarter. <clears throat> But anyway, one of the girls asked Mitchell if she might enroll in the school, raised like most Quakers, you know, opposed slavery. And, of course, this was the debate what slavery was going on around that time. Anyway, Massachusetts in the um, – let me see here. The, you could go to school, which is very nice, but then the next thing you had to do – was how do you find the job? And that comes up later on in the talk where some of these famous women really went to work and at school but couldn't get a decent job. Um, by the age of 17, can you imagine that being the first lady astronomer? And then 133 years after her death, Mitchell's legacy continues in institutions as the Maria Mitchell Observatory. Now, I didn't even know that existed in Nantucket. Quite interesting. Now, now we're going to meet some women in science who uh, changed the world. Well, the, the physicists, I'm sure, know about Ma uh, Madame Curie. We all did. We learned that in school, you know, and. I didn't realize she won the, the uh, Nobel Prize t t twice. And then Ada Lovelace, the mathematician, the first compu computer programmer, and, was, and long before modern computers were invented. Well, I got to argue that point because I was reading in history as um, in Turkey uh, one of the uh, religious uh, leaders many in, in ancient times also had a, uh, a form of a computer using some type of, a, you, know, you know, with water and something else. But anyway, that's beside the point. <clears throat> Another lady, a botanist, 1897, first female plant scientist. You know, amazing. I never heard of her. You will learn about that in the in school? Probably not. Another lady, 
Chinch, I can't, I don't know how to pronounce that, but a physicist, and maybe you can explain it. She, uh, she refined Enrico Fermi's theory of radioactive beta decay, and she's also known for the Wu experiment. You probably know what that is. I don't. And the breakthrough led to a Nobel Prize that was awarded to her male colleagues with Wu's critical role in work overlooked. Imagine that. So this is one of the things that I found was aggravating in my uh, <clears throat> research for women. Avira Rubin, an astronomer, she discovered the existence of dark matter, that strange stuff that holds everything together. In fact, I was watching that last night again on the Science Channel. Did you mean to skip over uh, Franklin, the previous slide? Oh, Rosalind Frank, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Uh, she's known for her revolutionary work in discovering the double helix of DNA. And she passed away you know, four years before the awards. And then in the last sentence, she likely would have been snubbed by the committee. You know, that's extremely interesting, you know. <clears throat> but also, if I remember correctly, there's a limit of... Uh, two people who can get a Nobel Prize. So had she not passed away, and had they been willing to include her, I think there would have been a problem putting in three names. No, it's actually, there's a limit of three people, because right. I have a friend who was the fourth recently in a project that Is did that not the get the Nobel Prize. 50 years ago? I, I, that I don't know. That's a good, that's a very good point. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I remember as a young engineer, you know, you know, when I was uh, going to school, uh, even some of the uh, male, uh, uh, I'm going to call them scientists and engineers that try to make a discovery at some science board, whether it's in Europe or here. I mean, in some, I mean, it, <clears throat> they were literally insulted, you know, at times, you know, you know. So, but for a woman. I think it was just a double barrel type of situation. They were doubly uh, embarrassed. You know? Well, the second name for a Nobel Prize is sometimes et al. Et al. Yeah. Now, here's Gladys West. She worked in developing, uh, you know, <clears throat> this, the, the, the mathematical modeling for GPS. And uh, okay. thank God for GPS because. Uh, I mean, around here, I'm fine, but when I used to go to Europe and visit my family in London, guys, driving on the left-hand side, of course, messed me up no end, but at least the GPS kept me going on the right, in the left direction. <laughs> and here's another one. This is the one I, uh, I'm going to stop sharing for, maybe I, I, I shouldn't, but I, I won't do it, because if I, if I sh stop sharing, I'll, I'll probably mess things up. But Pearl Luella Kendrick, she, she is on the cover of the Smithsonian Magazine of this month. And it says on the cover of the magazine, she ended a deadly plague. She most certainly did. It's a, good, it's a very good read about she and three other ladies who uh, uh, found the vaccine whooping cough. Here's the next lady here, Grace Eldering, and she, she contracted and survived whooping cough when she was five, leading to her involvement in science in her adulthood. And uh, actually, the ladies went to school, became PhDs. <clears throat> and here's another one an African-American chemist also. And these people worked at the state uh, laboratories for uh, public health. You know? So I thought that was quite, quite cool. Oh, yeah. Um, the two doctors recruited uh, Dr. Gordon, a lab technician, for assistance together. The three women, you know, that you can read that for yourself, but they devised a research lab and conducted lab experiences. 
It was amazing what these ladies did. They actually, I'm not sure they developed a scientific method, but they did everything as, uh, very, very organized so that they could use the data and manipulate the data to get answers, you know, to the effectiveness of the, you know, to the vaccines. And uh, I didn't mention that in the slides, but uh, I mean, at that particular time, these ladies really did their work and they did it so they could use it later on. Now, I don't know, let's see. Oh, diphtheria, pertussis. I didn't realize that whooping cough was called pertussis until I uh, started working on this one. That was. I mean, I was a kid with whooping cough, and every, that was every kid's worry. I hope I don't get it. You didn't worry about it. You just got it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and here's a uh, photograph of the three of them here. And I don't, I, I don't have the reference for where it was, but I, I just thought it was, it'd be nice to see these people be, you know, working together. Now, another one, Fossey Wong Stahl, a virologist and molecular biologist. Huh? She was the, she cloned the HIV, she was the first one to cre uh, create the clone for HIV. Uh, <clears throat> it's almost a repeat, I mean, the, um, the virus today is almost a repeat of what she did in, you know, you know in the 50s, I guess. Uh, Jennifer Duna. Uh, Biochemist, CRISPR, amazing. Now, in all fairness, um, she's been mentioned several times, or did she win the Nobel Prize? I forget. Someone, uh, you're beginning to get to the sort of later stages where uh, certainly I've heard about all of these women mm. who have been instrumental, including the Polish um, PhD at University of Pennsylvania, who was responsible for the MNRA vaccines, mm -hmm. um, who I would expect at some point in the near future to get a Nobel Prize for that. Yes, uh, Dalna and Charpentier, both females, got the Nobel Prize uh, two years ago. For yeah. what? CRISPR. For CRISPR, right, right. Right, yeah. Okay, I remember something about CRISPR. Well, you see, when I was going to school, all the, all the people in my books were physicists or mathematicians, males. And uh, I almost got myself in trouble one time at, 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 at the Air Force Base. I went to a, uh, I was invited to go to MIT lecture. And I went over to the building, you know, I get there early and I'm talking to this young lady, a very nice young lady, but I didn't know who the speaker was, because all I heard was a name, and you couldn't, I didn't know if it was a, a male or a female, but it <laughs> actually turned out to be the girl I was talking to was the speaker. So she told me, well, I'm the speaker. <clears throat> I looked at her in surprise. I mean, she very young, very pretty. And uh, <clears throat> I said, you know, I said, I told her what I just told you guys, I didn't have any more information except the name, but I couldn't tell if it was a male or female. And I says, I was thinking, you know, for a physicist, an old fuddy-duddy. I thought she was going to die off. She said, I understand. <laughs> so I wouldn't know about these other people because uh, most of them were the uh, people who uh, were, were the older guys. Anyway, next slide. Oh, yeah. My, well, this is going by faster than I thought. The, you know, the last person, have you guys heard of uh, Paula Raspel? Anyway, she, um, I didn't, I, I didn't realize that, uh, I, I know she worked at GBH, but I didn't realize, you know, what she really did. She did more for science of making science available to everybody, and she put it in such a format that um, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, even my wife, who you know, which was she was uh, who was a, a a clinical social worker, said, "Boy, this is really interesting," you know, and she could understand it. Whereas if I try to explain to them some of the stuff to my grandkids, I got to be very careful, you know. I try to use words that they'd understand, but. Uh, she was marvelous for uh, all the uh, NOVA and uh, other scientific ventures that she presented on uh, public television. And that was the, uh, these are the, re that's my uh, talk. And if you want to have a discussion about this, this would be fine. I, I'd uh, maybe add, uh, I'm kind of surprised with the computer backgrounds here that Grace Hopper hasn't come on to the list. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing m most people have probably heard of her. Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. and Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't she, it, it, yeah. isn't she the one that's, uh, isn't there a, a software package she did? She was, I think. Uh, it she, might be. Yeah. yeah. Ahead. Harry go ahead. probably more than I do. <laughs> uh, no, 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 I don't. Uh, no, go ahead. No, I, I was going to I think she was involved in sort of early, I'm just looking at Wikipedia now, but uh, one of the first programmers of the Harvard Mark I computer. And she invented one of the first linkers, whatever that is. I think it's like a, a, a compiler maybe. And I guess uh, she, she was one of the first to talk about machine independent programming languages and uh, talk about somebody impressive. She was born in 1906. She got her PhD in mathematics at Yale, and uh, she was a professor of math at Vassar. She tried to enlist in the Navy during World War II, but she was rejected because she was 34 years old. I guess she was too old. So instead, she joined the Navy Reserves. Uh, she later rose to become a rear admiral, but she was deep into pioneering early computer programming. It wasn't Ada, and, uh, was it? No, I, think was, I don't think. I think it was Cobol. Cobol, Cobol. Was, Cobol was her. Big There's thing. also an anecdote about uh, there was a problem with the computer, and and uh, she looked at it closely and found that there's a moth in there. Pulled it out, and that's the first case or one of the cases of playing a bug right. in, in the computer or debugging <laughs> system. It goes yeah, back these, to her, that area. Those were analog. Those were analog computers. So <laughs> the bug literally would, would get it in the way. But she, uh, she's pro she may be the only uh, woman mathematician who also has a guided missile destroyer named after her, the USS Hopper. <laughs> she also has one of the colleges, residential colleges at Yale named after her. So that's interesting. I didn't know that. I didn't, that name didn't pop up when I was doing my searches. <laughs> I mean, I didn't do it. <laughs> I think a, a more a general point that I take away from thank you for indeed raising this topic is that if you look around today, you're seeing the contributions of women being much more visible and and and, and women being on air on TV. If you look at some of the CNN and and uh, even Fox, you'll see a lot of analysts um, that are stretching their academic wings and being taken seriously than ever before. So, I mean, I don't think it's just science that has been uh, putting the muzzle on 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 the the abilities of women. And I think we are all the better for it. Bring, you know, uh, seriously taking taking the. The, the intelligence of, of, of half the population uh, a little more serious and 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 we're we we we'd all benefit for that. Oh, that Cindy, the, how Cindy, how far do you think we've come? You're you're representing half the, the population. <laughs> you know, I I actually don't know. I, I, a few thoughts. I had a few thoughts when you mentioned CNN. And my thoughts are going to black women, actually. What you're seeing is a lot more black women. That's the real revolution that's going on right now. There's yeah. been more white women. And, and I'm wondering, I was really struck at the history of women in science to see that the white, the white women were pioneers. 
and they were ex unusual and extraordinary. And, they, and there were opportunities, they seized opportunities along the way. They were almost in the context of where, what they were doing, what they were around, what they were seeing, who they knew, like in Nantucket, the woman that was the scientist. We right. did it, there was a left talk on that in our group. And it was really clear how that happened and evolved over time. But I would, if you went back and looked at the list of women in science through a different lens, looking through a different lens, how many black women were there really that came up and how many are now? And what's that list at MIT, that admissions list that they're looking at? How many of those women, white women that are applying, you, so, you look down in that list again, how many of them are black? And are they oh, waitlisted? Wait yep. And mm -hmm. are they mm -hmm. supported? Um, and I think if they're going to be more, that support has to go <clears> way <throat> back into elementary school, frankly. I was one of the people that was interested in science in high school. I went to Watertown High School and I never really had the opportunity as a girl at a, in Watertown, there wasn't, you had to be in the right track. And I actually I was in curriculum A or whatever that was, um, but the track wasn't a, a track towards science. And you really had to have the math earlier. So I was the science wannabe. And I can remember getting in the bus and going to Boston because I think Emerson College had something on uh, a couple of lectures on physics for girls. And actually, I remember to this day, somebody talked about the book. It was somebody in Wonderland and physics explaining some concept. And I remember reading that book. But because my parents weren't scientists, it just didn't evolve as an opportunity for me. So I went in a completely di different direction. I was a bit rebellious. I, my goal was to get out of Watertown and see the world. That was basically my goal, which is <laughs> ironical because I kept the same friends for life to this day and ended up back in Watertown. We are friends for life. <laughs> Five of us went off the different, completely different tracks and I ended up living in Asia and working for the Wall Street Journal and um, in the Philippines, in Manila during the Marcos Revolution. So I, wow. and also living in Taiwan briefly as a, as an intern, were for a Chinese news, uh, magazine, and also ended up living in Bangkok, working as an intern for Associated Press during the Vietnam War. Now, all of those tracks took me in different directions, but here I am back with this group, enjoying science and feeling completely out of place. But I feel like, okay, it's come first circle, I didn't get to do it that round, but this is the way I'm going to do it. And even now, I would have liked to contribute more. But as a woman, I'm pulled in so many directions with so many responsibilities. I don't have the time. So some things don't change. <laughs> that's my comment. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. You know, it, it, you remind, it's, it's like Paula Aspel, you know, uh, I didn't realize she was Jewish because, uh, because she did a... Uh, uh, a couple of things for PBS on uh, the uh, Jewish people during World War II fighting back. And you know, she did a couple of archaeological uh, shows on tunnels in various places, in various camps. And she said that was one of her most touching moments, at least, you know, in, in applying her job, you know, you know, to her, you know, to her background. And, but she did an awful lot for science. I mean, she likes science. You know, I think probably no field has been more changed by gender distribution than medicine. I mean, as I was, when I was a kid, there were no women doctors. I mean, they were very singular. You know, and now, what is it? I think half the profession? Same thing with who goes to college. Right. You know, it's now 55% in, in <clears throat> mostly female in most places. MIT is singular in that it is still majority male. When I uh, graduated from Yale, I was the, in the last all-male class in 1969. Um, 
now Poor Yale, guy. It, Poor guy. <laughs> Yale, Yale now has more women in the undergraduate classes than men. Um, and in fact, there's uh, not only that, but I have, I mean, I was from, I was actually one of the, one of the renegades because I went to a public high school as opposed to a private school yeah. <laughs> that, that was considered to be a renegade in those days. Um, yeah. <laughs> now um, uh, uh, the, the demographics of the Yale undergraduate uh, it is, you know, like we're seeing in, in many universities, um, uh, an awful lot of it is made up of either Asian or American Asian, um, and 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 all of those sort of things that I think were major limitations to the to the social life in terms of insular so social life at yeah. Yale when I was there have seem now to be breaking through. I mean, who knows? Uh, I know it's still, you know, one of these places, but um, it, it is getting better. Uh, and it's not getting better because Yale really tried to do anything it's about it. It's because the people who who had the smarts uh, uh, broke down the gates, if you will, and, and, and God bless them for doing that. Harry, could I, I just want to make a, this is an interesting factoid is um, David, my uh, my fiance, his father, he went to Yale in class of 67. Uh -huh. uh, excuse, me, excuse me, not class of 67, class of 76. My late husband was class of 67. But when his dad was at Yale, it was 1937 and he's Jewish, the family's Jewish, it was a Jewish quota. So he was one of 13 Jewish, of course, men, right. boys at that time. Right. Wow. That was the And, and, and in my year, actually, there the there was a there was an active attempt to include more Jews specifically, and in fact, my class had the largest percentage of Jewish students um, that that Yale had ever had. So there was some movement, but it was in you know a, you know a, a limited uh, domain, if you will, um, and uh, uh, but you know it, it did start. But 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 in 1971 was the huge change in terms of admitting women, and I know some people who lived in Lexington who were in that class, um, and uh, they're very proud of being the first women at Yale. And and it and but I think it, it probably the the the, the uh, at, at the great consternation of all the old grads who expected their legacy <laughs> sons to get into Yale, um, there wasn't enough room um, uh, after uh, 10 years of, of, of that. Well, the other thing, when I went to MIT, um, the, the women were referred to as co-eds. I do not believe they're referred to as co-eds anymore. <laughs> yeah. uh, Harry, what you said reminded me of, I went to Lowell Tech, it was called Lowell Textile Institute when I went, and uh, Lowell teaches- Was college. the Lowell Textile uh, a joke or? No, it's not a joke. <laughs> but Lowell, oh, I see, because Lowell- Tech I know, I realize that Lowell Textile might make sense, but Lowell yeah. Technology is the norm, you know. Well, they call it Lowell Tech, you know, but uh, at the time it was uh, mostly, uh, you know, textiles. I was a second engineering class, electronic engineering class, and there were six girls in the, in the engineering class, and that included the textile engineering. One of them I'm friendly to this day, a Jewish girl. And uh, in those days, it, it was mostly guys, you're right. They didn't worry about religion because they were foreign students and, you know, people from out of state that come to the school. But uh, when I go down there now and see all these young people there, you know, to me, it's more normal. This is about 50-50, you know, as far as male and female. And you're right. We live through a, uh, an age of transition and awakening and learning, you know, in, in what real life should be like, you know. Yeah, Peace in the New York Times last it has taken a long time to get to this point because if you think about the beginning a long time ago where we were in the law of the jungle, and then we transitioned maybe to 
the law of the nomads, as we started moving around and populating different areas, uh, you had the hunters, which turned out to be more muscular. And then you have the people that really made things work at home. And then I think it didn't, wasn't really until the 20th century that people started thinking both about the concepts of equality and equity. And uh, it has taken a long time to actually uh, consciously realize that what some generations before us thought that it was the natural way of things mm -hmm. is not. I mean, today, as far as I'm concerned, we're in the jungle of the brain because essentially it's intelligence that rules. And when we start taking that as the governing factor, oh, we're behind. We men are behind. <laughs> yeah, Tony, I, I've, I think been, you, uh, I've been listening on. I've been listening on the side, and, oh, I, uh, and I, I know you all mean well. But uh -oh. would you guys please think about it before you use the word "girl" or "ladies" instead of "women"? That's true. That's true. That's a very legitimate. Thing. It, 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 I will say, um, I, I try very hard not to use, um, uh, what's I, diminutive terms to women. Um, and it is uh, a uh, retraining your brain in terms of your language. Um, and I recognize the difficulty of doing that, but you're absolutely right. Could, could I give you and boys a little historical context? I think you missed the boat about a women's education. In fact, uh, it was a little over 2,000 years ago that the Jews decided that all women should be fully educated. And it was only a mere 2,000 years later that the British figured that out. But the concept has been around for a little while. You just missed it. And, and, Yale, and Yale was the last of the bunch, as we heard from Harry. Well, there were no yeah. Jews. Oh, well, wait, 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 wait a second. It was not the last. It was not the last of the Ivy Leagues. It was actually one of the earlier ones in the Ivy League. And that, Is that you know, right? depends who you're. Well, yes, well I, absolutely. I lived, through, I lived through that in medicine that, in fact, when I applied to medical school, I didn't apply to Cornell because they had a, a quota of 6% Jews. That was their quota. And the, the oh, symbol wow. at a number institution was was uh, for a Jewish applicant. They didn't write that they were Jewish. They just put two circles, a circle within a circle on their application. Ooh. That was the bagel. <laughs> that's, how, hey. that's how they signified it. And uh, what happened at Columbia, there was a Dean George Pereira uh, as a Portuguese. And George Pereira was the scion of the very, very smart guy, but he was the scion of the wealthy Pereira, Pereira family who are Portuguese Jews. And he ended discrimination a, a few years before me at Columbia Medical School. We had a quota of Jews in our class, but it was 97%, so nobody was objecting. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harry, I have a theory about admitting women to Yale in your class. Yeah. I, I might be wrong, but I'm seeing some anecdotal evidence that it's true. Is when they, it, they decided to admit women in 1969, it was pretty controversial. A lot of yes. the donors were very upset about that. And they really was a strong pushback. So yep. I have noticed, I know quite a few women that, because I'm involved in Yale Day of Service, that are part of that early group. And I'm really struck that how many of them have parents or fathers that went to Yale. So oh. I am wondering if they didn't accept the the legacy girls to uh, quiet the, the right opportunity. absolutely absolutely you, they, they didn't accept a lot of people from public school and not from Watertown and I'm still right. bitter about that <laughs> don't forget this this issue of of the legacy uh, as being a bad thing has been only come to the public's attention with the whatever the name of this uh, scandal is. Uh, it, it didn't reach the, the New York Times uh, uh, or, or, or the Daily News until only the last three or four years as a major topic. And now people are outraged at the practice, although it was very clear 
um, that that practice was spoken about openly all the time. You know, oh, is this a legacy uh, student? Uh, and, you know, so it doesn't this surprise me. And I'm not sure that Yale has uh, has abandoned that even yet, nor has Harvard, Dartmouth, uh, any any of the other Ivy Leagues. And I bet it's probably even true at some of the bigger, uh, more prestigious state schools. You know, but you know, uh, legacy works. Legacy can work against students in some ways too. Um, my daughter is a legacy at Harvard, um, and she she was put in a, in a rooming group as a as a freshman, fresh person, um, as with some other who were legacies, literally legacies. Not that they didn't earn their way in legacies in the sense that they're that their parents were uh, Harvard alums. And I remember my daughter saying that they kept discussing with among themselves, do we really belong here? You know? Imposter you know, syndrome. Yeah, you know, was it was it because our parents went to Harvard or did we really earn our way? I well, now everybody uh, the legacy blues scandal is not about legacies per se. Not trying to say there shouldn't be any. It's about fraud and bribery and pretending people True. are qualified when they're not and paying oh, yes. money for the positions. This well, is legacy. very wealthy families only. Well, well, uh, legacy doesn't uh, issue uh, donations, by the way. I mean, you may be considered like you may be technically considered a legacy, but if you haven't been very involved in the alumni fund. Trust me, it doesn't work. I can testify to that. Harry, uh, uh, the um, many of the colleges uh, they say they're need blind, but they're not need stupid. And the uh, what they they <laughs> track who pays, and the the probability of a legacy paying full tuition is much greater. And yes. The, uh, if you look at donor donations from legacies and legacy families, they're substantially higher than. And the other group. Right. So they have their own venal interest as to why they admit legacies. Yeah. No, I sports. absolutely not understand being good that. Sports. No. no. So I taught, <laughs> I taught at Colgate University for 36 years. It considers itself an elite liberal arts college. I heard the president stand up in front of the faculty meeting in about 1972 and say, listen, if someone shows up saying he's going to give this college a million dollars, we're going to look very closely and I don't want to hear anything from the admissions office about the person uh, uh, letting this, letting somebody in. I mean, it was a completely yeah. cynical, right up front right. Uh, statement that I think it went on. Yeah. But, yeah. but if you want to see real cynicism on need blind, this and that, look at the athletic scholarships. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. on, the other, on the other side of the coin of trying to get a job, you just reminded me, I used to work for Stone and Webster in downtown Boston. <clears throat> And uh, they were an old Yankee uh, con uh, company, at least they used to be. But anyway, I worked in their nuclear engineering part because I'm a, you know, I had Department of Defense background and they wanted somebody for product assurance, reliability and all that stuff. So I said, anyway, my point is a very nice young woman came in. I think that's what that you would say, I should say. And... <laughs> She was interviewing for the job, and she spoke to some of us, and I think I was one of the guys she spoke to, and uh, she appeared to be well qualified. In my fact, she was well qualified. She didn't get the job. So being a kind of guy, I asked my boss, how come? Because he used to work at the, at the, at the Boston Navy Yard, and you know, most of the guys there were from the Navy Yard, but I asked him. He said, if I hired that young lady, a young woman, he says, I wouldn't be able to get any work done here. And I said, you've got to be crazy. I said, <laughs> I said, we're all grown men, you know. But anyway, that was a shock to me that this, this woman, well qualified, couldn't get a job, you know, working on a nuclear power plant prog a program office. What year was that? In the 70s, 75, 76. There was a uh, an article, I think, in 
the communications of the ACM that talked about diversity in computer science in the computer science profession, pointing out that uh, in the early days of computers, uh, the employees working with computers were far more diverse than they were, say, in the 70s or 80s. And that was an interesting effect of the fact in the early days of computers, no one knew anything about um, computers. And so it was basically those who worked in it were based upon pure talent, as opposed to later on when parents would think about giving gifts to their children at various celebration times, um, they would choose to give boys computers and girls, I'm, I'm not sure what else they gave them, but the point is that kids started to learn at home. The boys started to learn at home much faster than the girls because of just the parental assumptions about what each of the genders would be interested in. And so the, the, the conclude. I mean, I, I'm sure that's not the only reason that the computer industry became more male dominated. But there was an interesting period early on in the 50s when there yeah. were just as many women programmers as there were men. Mm -hmm. Small number of people, but nevertheless, it was much more, uh, it was much more even. Yeah, now what I should tell you, you know, about that job at uh, Stone and Webster, you know, I was in a, a systems electronic engineer, all right? <clears throat> and I was in the program office, you know, and I got to see all the systems. But the one area that I didn't get into, when I look back and think about it, was the control room, all right? 20 years later, we had, it was a uh, three mile, not, not three mile, but the, that plant in Pennsylvania that had issues. Um, I found out that the control room, you know, in a nuclear power plant, which I knew, the number of controls like doubled. So there were more people in the control room and you had a lot of things to watch. In the 70s, computers were, you know, mets are mets. And to, to get to the point is, because of lack of uh, computers, the the, uh, the alarms, they went off, I think, with Three Mile Island or something like that. Uh, they all went off at the same time. They were not prioritized. Well, since I, when I found that out, I was, a, I was appalled because I didn't know about it. If I would have known about that, that being from DOD, being in, in the systems, you got to prioritize what you're going to fix, you know? Well, not only did they not prioritize it, this was the first time ever that the electric companies had to do uh, monthly and quarterly maintenance on, on their equipment. They never did it on the uh, fossil plants. I just let them run. But anyway, that, that was my point about the uh, uh, computers. Uh, uh, yeah, getting back, to the, getting back to the early days of computers, there was a lot of uh, hand computation and mathematics involved, and it was very detailed work. Even though in World War II, the reason why women came to the forefront was that men were going to the front as soldiers. Yeah. Women seem to have shown at the time a particular right. talent for code breaking and mathematics. Uh, right. There seems to have been some functional difference, at least then, in how women's yeah. and men's minds work. The detailed orientated. And just math ability, a natural feel for math. Uh, at the time, maybe it was cultural, maybe it's something that actually still exists. Uh, some of the mathematical concepts uh, and just seeing the patterns in codes. Uh, women seem to have done better. And to this day, they seem to test better than men on some of these parameters. Right. Right. Right, they had two talks. You had the Benchley girls, and they had the other one there about the uh, some local uh, Lincoln Park or something like that. Uh, you know, just uh, that one... was tu Tuxedo Park. Tuxedo Park, yeah. <laughs> you know, just to just to prove, Harry. You know, I share a lot with Harry uh, 
we have coffees in the morning at Pete's. And uh, <laughs> one of the other things we share is I was in the last all male, I was in the 337th graduating class at Boston Latin School, which was the last of an all male Latin school. <laughs> they used to call it boys Latin school informally. But uh, then not, so I've since had two nieces graduate from there. They're much smarter than I am. But kind of a weird uh, kind of artifact of sexism, kind of cutting the other way, kind of thing, images we get in our heads of what should boys do and what should girls do. In my all-male Latin school experience, one interesting thing that kind of came back, <laughs> haunted me through my career was typing class. You know, at Latin school, they would have a typing class. It was in the basement. It was always a very small class. And these teenage boys would all be thinking, well, who are these losers learning to type? Because, you know, girls type. That's not what the guys do. And, uh, of course, I spent 40-year career at a keyboard <laughs> hunting and pecking. And it probably cost me probably months of my life's time you know, in slow <laughs> typing that I didn't take take typing. But at the time, right, that was the other side. Boys, well, you know, you don't type. And of course, yeah, we were about to enter the the era of computers and keyboards. Yeah. I, I, have, uh, I, have, two com I have two comments. Um, first of all, um, I have an MBA from the time when um, my MBA class had six women and over 200 men. Um, when we wow. were interviewing at the for jobs at the end of um, the program, I cannot tell you how many times I was asked if I could type. <laughs> and um, one person, one interviewer asked me, "How do you think you're going to function in a man's world?" And I told him to go look out in the hall um, because it was a man's world that I was functioning in. Oh. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, Dan and I have been taking an OWL course um, about free speech in, um, in, in schools. And um, at the beginning of the program, um, the, the instructor uh, shared some information about, um, I guess we'll call it sexism in the schools. Um, that um, women tend to participate less in, um, in discussions than men. This may have changed over time, but at the time that the surveys were done, women participated less in discussions than men. Um, women, when they did participate, were interrupted more often than men. And um, when a woman came up with a good idea, there would be a man who would grab it and run with it, and she would never, and she wouldn't get credit. The 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 uh, effect of mansplaining comes to mind uh, <laughs> when uh, you know that 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 social dynamic where women are explained things. In, in in easy details for no reason at all. And, and uh, I, I'm really interested to see how your life experience proceeded after business school. I mean, did, did, did you feel that you ever got to the point where you were taken as an equal in, in, a, in a men, women world, business world? I applied for a promotion once and was told we already have enough women at that level. You're not, we're, you're not going to get the job. <laughs> and they had enough women. I think they had two. Um, okay, I have, oh, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so no. <laughs> the yeah, other thing yeah. that's interesting in, in this discussion is that they was mentioned in the class. Well, I think it was mentioned in the class. Um, there are, somewhere now between four and six men's colleges in the United States, but there are about 60 women's colleges. 
And uh -huh. um, I personally went to a women's college because in high school, I felt like I was, um, I don't know, it, it was hard, it was hard to make friends and such in high, with, with guys in high school because I was smart. And I decided that I wanted to totally divorce my social life from my academic life. So I went to a women's college. Um, and I think that helped a lot in terms of being able to speak out and being able to participate in my education. Um, Harry, I have also another kind of answer related to your question about what experience uh, women may have had in a business school. This is not, of course, my own. It's from a close friend that in the 70s, she was 60s, late 60s, early 70s, was in the Harvard Business School. And at that time, she was told straight to her face by at least two people, she said, what are you doing here? You're going to be taking a job away from men, from a man. And uh, she said that it took 50 years for those two guys to come back to her and apologize in the 50th reunion. But all <laughs> yeah. that time, essentially, they could remember it. Maybe they mulled over it. Maybe they changed their mind eventually, but it took 50 years. Wow. So, wow. One data point. <laughs> Amazing they remembered. Yeah, I was going to say, well, it was bothering them for 50 years, which is a good <laughs> sign. <impressive. Yeah. laughs> I was going to ask Mike, Mike Alexander a question over there. Um, I was just curious, what was the environment for you in the, you know, in the lab? about, you know, women, you know, PhDs and all this other area, because, you know, I, I was an ESC, which is different. Um, well, let me start with graduate school uh, in physics at Cornell. We had a few women and um, some of them did very, very well. But the, one of the things that really sort of shocked me as we went along was that um, a number of them just dropped out or got married. And, and I couldn't understand why. And they married other graduate students. And um, this is in the, the mid-60s. I, I can tell you even in the 1980s, my sister was in a physics program at one of the Ivy League schools. She dropped out entirely from the field because of sexual harassment by her mm -hmm. advisor. Okay. Well, that's I'm the probably, kind of thing that was going on even in the 1980s. Uh, that's that's not why you drop out because you got married. Yeah, right. And it was. Uh, I mean, that's a little different. Yeah, they were marrying other graduate students. Now, it, 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 my experience in in several other labs was that you know, that women were welcomed. They were treated essentially as it wasn't just at uh, at, at Hanscom. It was GTE laboratories. It was in an army lab at which I worked. It was at, uh, well, there weren't any women at Thermo Electron that I can recall in, in engineering or science positions. But they were essentially equal. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't notice any particular difference. It would be interesting to know if they had, uh, if the payroll was equal. I have yeah. no idea. Yeah. Right. I have no idea about that in the government the payroll would have had to have been equal by, by law yeah. Right. yeah and that would have been monitored i mean that's not but but and no i i i, 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 I know I, I was i was a vice president of human resources at um at a company and um i was laid off after an acquisition um and i was replaced by somebody who was earning at least 30% more than they were paying me after I'd been there for 11 years. Wow. So Evelyn, you actually, as vice president of human resources, probably saw how much women were banking compared to men. What were you seeing? Um, 
it was a, it was an organization in the medical field, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the a lot of the employees were nurses. So you know there was a there was a preponderance of preponderance yeah. of women in the in the organization. Now, just getting back to uh, women getting married and dropping out of graduate programs, actually, that can be a sign that there is hostility and discrimination because uh, it's a choice, yes, but sometimes it's a choice that's strongly encouraged by the behavior of male colleagues and uh, male superiors. And it doesn't have to be just sexual harassment. It could be basically... Uh, you know the, the 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 dismissing of their their academic uh, results as a result of well it came you know yeah I should have more broadly said gender harassment without mm -hmm. specifically mentioning the kind of thing right. that right. I my sister experienced but you know I think there was a big change in the culture that hadn't really got fully underway in the late fifties and that many women were raised to think that what they should do is find a husband as soon as possible. I was in graduate school There was at Wisconsin. There was one woman in the physics program, very fine woman, good at her physics. The, the guys in our group, uh, I had four children before I was done with graduate school. Uh, my best friend had five children before. Another guy who came into the department had five children when he arrived, had two more then and one later. I mean, we were, I mean, you can tell what the women were doing in a way. Uh, and, um, you know, and, you know, it, without apologizing or, um, uh, you know, it was just very much still the post-war uh, attitude of coming back and let's get a family and let's get going. Uh, you know, today, uh, uh, I mean, I know some particular examples. I know one woman who got her PhD in physics and had two children in graduate school while she did it. Uh, and I look with awe on that. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it has changed. Uh, almost nobody in graduate school has many children or any children. Uh, that, that's a big change. The children are all coming much later. So there's a cultural change here, which explains some of what women did back then. And, you know, you can say the culture was, you know, uh, not a good culture. It was, uh, it, it undermined uh, personhood of women in, in, in ways, but it was there and it had its effect. Yeah, well, it had a lot to do with family dynamics and how uh, the role of women in the family was. Uh, that the men were able to devote time outside of the home to uh, advancing their uh, degrees and their careers, whereas women did not have that option until probably at least the 1970s. I started oh, wow. Colgate in 1967. My first vote in a faculty meeting was to go co-ed. That was... Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which way did you, you vote? Charlie. I voted for it. Uh, you, 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 cannot, you cannot believe you cannot believe how vicious the male culture was in an all male school. You know, I don't know about Yale, but Colgate was just simply dreadful. Uh, oh, know, it, yeah, uh, it, it, it was indeed. Um, it took it took uh, that was being talked about for a long time and it was only sort of in the late in 1969 and we all we all know what else you know, all the other things going on in there when when this issue came uh, to the to the public uh, uh, visibility but i think it had been going to talk for a while and it was only until that little sort of uh, um, breakthrough of, of 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 what's important that was going, you know, being questioned in 69, um, co-ed, you know, making Yale co-ed uh, was, uh, came to the front. And, and before we get, uh, you know, before one looks with and praises what one's saying, there was a very strong economic reason to go co-ed, at least 
Uh, remember, in the 60s, there was a huge expansion of American higher education to absorb the baby boom, the post-war baby boom. By 1970, it was pretty clear the boom was about to end, and there was going to be competition among the schools, both to maintain their quality and to attract quality students. And the, the obvious way to do that was to go co-ed. So that you yeah. suddenly double the number of smart kids that you might persuade to come to your school. There were a couple of other things that boomed after 1969, including the cost of going to Yale. When I left Yale, yeah. it cost $3,600, I believe, a year to attend there. And uh, today, uh, I don't know what it costs, but I, uh, you know, I know it's ten times, twenty times that. Twenty. Come on, times. come on, Harry. When I went to Wisconsin, I had to pay the outrageous out-of-state <laughs> tuition of two hundred and fifty dollars a year. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, at, at Yale, anybody that gets in there, if they can't afford it now, their endowment has been so successful, their tuition is paid for. So uh -huh. there's, there, the students don't have a financial problem, as far as I know. This is called. Say, I'm sorry. Say again. I think that the student, they, they, their endowment now is so huge that they have guaranteed that their students' tuition will be paid for if they need the money, or partially, yeah. or whatever. They've worked it out. So it, that's why so many people are applying now because it's it's a great deal. If you I get see. into no. it, then you don't have to worry about that. Let's put it this way. When I went to N, when my son went to NYU after not getting in as a legacy student at Yale, uh, I was paying like forty thousand dollars a year and thinking, whoa, you know, what's this all about? Uh, so, uh, it, yes, I guess the uh, the well endowed uh, Ivy League schools can do that, but it's generally not the not the case. And, and you know, Harry, yeah. back then I remember I could get a haircut for fifty cents. <laughs> you still can, Charlie. I'll do it for no, you. No, I can do it. For <laughs> <three now. laughs> and Harry, do, Harry, don't worry. Lexington families aren't getting the free tuition at the at the Ivy no. leagues. None of mine no. are at Ivy leagues, but I don't think we're considered generally in that category. So, I, you're stuck with a list, list price. I mean, the thing, yeah. thing about it is comparable economics. When I graduated, the four years that you paid in tuition was what you got paid for your first job. Now it's very tough to attain that, that uh, benchmark. And then yeah. the schools with the uh, and did big endowments, the government came down and said you get to spend 4% of it a year. And so some of that trickled down in, into tuition reductions. But I also know of people that quit their jobs so they show less income when they apply for school aid. Because <laughs> uh -huh. it makes a lot of sense. It's like childcare is another uh, problem these days. Back then, nobody had childcare. They'd, uh, take care of their own kids or, or they carpool with their, with, with their uh, friends. Mm -hmm. yeah. So back you know, to the, uh, challenge, I, the challenges of today for women and men is now with everybody working, it presents a whole new challenging problems because all of uh, many, many of us probably have daughters and sons now who with both working with kids and it's really tough. We'd like to thank David and I, I would like to thank everybody for coming to the meeting and staying a little bit extra if you did.